Hi there, Euro Bears. In this recorded slideshow lecture, I'm going to talk about the great artist Michelangelo. Michelangelo came out of Florence at the exact same time that Leonardo da Vinci did. So he's yet one another of these amazing artists that came out of Florence during the Renaissance. He's yet another artist who is, of course, patronized by the Medici family. The Medici family and their money, uh, it, it, it just created a situation where amazing artists emerged and individuals who were clearly born with a lot of talent uh, had an ability to develop that talent and create some of the most amazing art in all of European and world history. So the story of Michelangelo. Uh, the story of Michelangelo marks a transition in the Renaissance. So some historians talk about an early Renaissance and a high Renaissance. And the early Renaissance is the Renaissance that is focused around Florence and really everything up through the death of Lorenzo de' Medici in 1492. And with the death of Lorenzo de' Medici in 1492, there is a shift uh, from Florence down to Rome. And the major patrons of the arts are usually now the popes from here on out and uh, the Roman Catholic Church. They become the big patrons of the arts and, 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 this, and the scene shifts to Rome. Uh, I, I choose the year 1492. There's really no clear year from the transition from the early Renaissance to the high Renaissance. But so much else happens in 1492, including the death of Lorenzo de' Medici, along with a new pope, Pope Alexander VI, uh, becomes the pope in 1492, as well as, of course, Christopher Columbus sailing the ocean blue in 1492. So it's just a nice, e nice easy year to remember, since so much else happens in that, uh, that important year in European and world history. It's worth mentioning this book uh, at this point in time. Uh, we know a lot about the lives of the artists from the 15th and 16th century. And, and why is that? How do we know so much? Well, this is a principal text for, uh, historian, or for art historians. It's also a great book if you are an artist yourself and you're kind of interested in the creative method of artists, especially the artists of the Renaissance. So this is Gregory Vasari's The Lives of the Artist. Vasari was himself an artist, and he knew Michelangelo, and he knew Raphael. He interacted with them. And so, and especially as a painter himself, he had a unique appreciation for what they were actually doing as painters. And he recorded their stories. Now, this book is an important book, and you can consider it important, an important work of art for the Renaissance itself, because it's one of the first multi-part biographies in history uh, it's really one of the first big biographies of the Renaissance era. And it's important in that it is actually celebrating the lives of the artist. So let's go over why this is important. Throughout most of history up until this point of time, artists were simply craftsmen. The important people were the money behind the artists, the patrons. So the popes who, who gave money to Michelangelo or 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 the or the or the Medici that you know commissioned the works of Botticelli. Um, the art the artists were just the ones who just did the work for the for the church or for the wealthy or or whoever. Vasari in the lives of the artists really wants to celebrate the artists and say no, it's not the money behind them that's the that that's of significance here. What's of significance is the fact that there are human beings that are walking the earth who have these amazing talents. Leonardo da Vinci deserves to be celebrated. Michelangelo deserves to be celebrated. Raphael deserves to be celebrated. And Vasari, you know, tries to explain their genius and as an artist just can't believe what they're doing. It's just so amazed and so stunned by it. And really his explanation for their genius is God. <laughs> he says that these people are so talented, clearly God has blessed them. And, uh, and, and, and that's how he explains their talent. Um, so historians kind of, you know, they read Vasari and they're like, okay, uh, how, how did they really develop their talent? Is, you know, maybe it is something they're born with or maybe it's something they develop. So yeah, it's a great question. Where does genius come from? So here is our next genius of art, Michelangelo. He was introspective. He was brooding. He was passionately religious. In other words, he was very different from his contemporary Leonardo da Vinci, which only makes for a fantastic story. These two men knew each other. They were, they, 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 they were with each other. They made works of art next to each other, literally physically next to each other. Uh, they saw each other in the Piazza della Signoria in Florence, and they absolutely hated each other. They weren't just competitive. They liked to mock each other in front of each other. 
So Michelangelo is a great contrast to Leonardo da Vinci. Da Vinci was light, bright, convivial, nice. You would enjoy hanging out with uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Michelangelo, not so much. He was the brooding loner. It would be hard to hang out with him for a while because he'd probably just either kick you out or leave himself. As a teenager, he demonstrated his abilities as a sculptor by sculpting this relief, the Battle of the Centaurs. Think of what he's doing here. This is stone. He, re he receives a piece of stone, a piece of marble from the Medici. They've paid for this expensive piece of stone, and they give him hammer and chisel and say, this is the scene that we want. Make it happen. You imagine going up to a rock and chiseling this out of it. This shows the talent of, of Michelangelo. Michelangelo would say, and this was reported by Vasari, that he would spend a lot of time with the marble, just looking at it, feeling it, and he would want to just release the image. He said he could feel the image within it, and as and by chiseling it, he was re the chiseling of stone, all he was doing was releasing the image, which is a very romantic way of describing uh, his, his job. Um, he did have some uh, techniques that he used uh, to, to help him release the image that he could feel within the stone, and I will talk about that later. Also, when he was sculpting for the Medici, he sculpted this. This is the, the Roman god of Bacchus. His Greek name was Dionysus. Bacchus, or Dionysus, was the Greek god of drunkenness and theater. Evidently, in the minds of the Greeks and Romans, those two things went together. Inebriation and the theater. And what an incredible Bacchus this is. Not only is it you know, an incredible human body that we see here, but he's stumbling. He's drunk a little bit. And, and, and that was a very difficult thing to capture in stone. Michelangelo is clearly showing off his talents. He did both uh, uh, the centaurs and Bacchus when he was in Florence. And Michelangelo will spend you know, some of his life in Florence and some of his life in Rome. A lot of the big things that you know him for, he did in Rome. Uh, the Pietà is an amazing sculpture from Michelangelo. He sculpted this for the Pope. This particular piece is in uh, uh, St. Peter's Basilica today. It's actually, if you go to, go to Rome and you go to the Vatican and you visit the biggest Roman Catholic cathedral in the world, St. Peter's Basilica, uh, this particular piece is pretty much right when you enter the door and you turn to the left and this is what you see. Now what you're looking at here is Mother Mary holding her dead son Jesus after he's been taken down off the cross. It's an amazing piece. It's, car it's, it's, it's carved out of marble. Look at the folds in Mary's, in, in Mary's dress or Mary's habit. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, it, it boggles the mind, I think, how this could be sculpted. Um, it's very interesting to look at the, the faces. I mean, you've got two very, very serene faces. Uh, it's hard to imagine Mary here being the mother of Jesus, uh, a man in, who died in his early 30s. Uh, looking at her face, she looks like a teenage girl still herself, but maybe this is supposed to symbolize the, the purity and innocence and virginity of Mother Mary. Great story about the Pietà is that uh, Michelangelo was watching tourists look at the sculpture and, and talk about it, and somebody started speaking erroneously about who sculpted this. And so Michelangelo, who pretty much had open access to St. Peter's Basilica, which was being built at this time, goes up to the uh, sculpt sculpture and, and adds a little something to it. Uh, he chiseled into the sculpture, Michelangelo the Florentine did this. Now this was a very daring and bold thing. Technically the sculpture does not belong to Michelangelo. It belongs to the Roman Catholic Church. They paid for it. It doesn't belong to him. So, so doing this... Uh, was pretty much an act of the Renaissance itself. It's a, it's a statement of individualism. I did this. It's not the church, and it doesn't belong to anybody else, and now there'll never be any dispute. Michelangelo the Florentine did this. It's chiseled across, uh, across, uh, the, across Mother Mary. Probably one of the most uh, famous sculptures ever done in the Renaissance is Michelangelo's David. This was done back up in Florence. We've had a sculpture of David before, way back about 100 years before, 
Uh, we had Donatello's David, which was a very effeminate young man stepping on the head of Goliath, who he just killed. Um, and uh, if you remember correctly, uh, that David was supposed to symbolize Florence. And that David was very effeminate because the effeminate values of poetry, art, music, loving over war, uh, that is what was being celebrated in Florence at the time. And, and that statue of David embodied that. This David also embodies Florence. Florence is David. David is Florence. Because David, when he faces off against Goliath, is the underdog. And Florence is in constant competition with Rome. And so the city council, the Signoria, commissioned this to be sculpted by Michelangelo. It originally was going to be placed atop of a government building, and David was supposed to be facing south to Rome. And so, so Michelangelo got his commission, and he begins the process of sculpting David. Now this David is very different from Donatello's David. This David is a beefcake. He is tough, he is brawny, he is not a weakling. And this is very common among Michelangelo's paintings and Michelangelo's sculptures. Um, this was considered to be so wonderful that when it was completed, it was not put up on top of, uh, on top of this uh, government building because they thought it was so perfect it needed to be down on the ground where people could see it. It's worth talking about um, Michelangelo's technique when he did this. First of all, he obsessed over his work, David and all of his work. So he would lock himself into a room. He wouldn't let anybody see it. He refused to take apprentices at all. Uh, he spent a lot of time with the marble. Once he thinks that he can release the form out of the marble, uh, he gets to work. Uh, but he had a technique. He would sculpt miniatures of David to get the right one and, and the one that he wanted. And then what he would do is he would take this miniature sculpture that he made for the model of the big one that he was going to do. And he would put it in a cylinder filled with li liquid. And bit by bit, he would drain the liquid from the cylinder, thus exposing first the top of the head of Michelangelo, and then bit by bit, drain a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And what was exposed in the cylinder from the liquid is what he would sculpt on that day. So he could look just at it a little bit, bit by bit, and that would be his guide for how to sculpt it. So he did have a technique. It wasn't just all you know, divine inspiration. But still, what an incredible thing to do. Even if I tried to do that, of course, there's no way I could do it. And most of us, uh, this is truly a work of genius. And it's amazing to think about when you get up close and you look, start looking at some of the details. This is rock and a chisel and hammer that has made this. And look at the absolute perfection of it. And this isn't like a painting where you can screw up, paint over it, and redo. And this is stone. And the fact that you can see these perfect veins in David's uh, uh, hand here is, um, is, is absolutely astounding. It's, so just take a moment to appreciate that. Michelangelo's David, you know, it's, 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 this David is a David at a different point in time than Donatello's David. Donatello's David is the victorious David. This David is the David who sees Goliath. And he's seeing Goliath for the first time. He's facing his enemy for the first time. Now, famously, as it's reported in the Bible, uh, the huge Goliath faces off against David. And David says to Goliath, you come at me with the force of strength, but I come at you with the force of the Lord. And slings the rock at Goliath and Goliath falls. So we're looking at David here, Michelangelo's David, the moment he sees Goliath. And Michelangelo is trying to capture that moment of fear. A lot of you at this point in time in your life have probably had this moment. You know, if you've got a big uh, match or a big sporting event and, you know, and, and you're the underdog, a, a significant underdog, and you see your enemy for the first time and that fear grips you. Uh, a lot of you feel this way when you do public speaking, you know, and you go in front of the audience for the first time and you're scared. Uh, whoever the enemy is, when you're looking at them for the first time and you wonder, do I have the strength within me? Uh, if, you're, if you're David, uh, it's do I have the strength of the Lord within me? And so this is a great, realistic expression uh, of the Renaissance right there. Um, so here are those two images, uh, again, from slightly different angles. Uh, Michelangelo, so obsessive over his work, very protective of his work, didn't want anybody looking at it, didn't want anybody criticizing it as he did it. Um, 
he would live with his work and he would not shower. Uh, he would spend months just working on a statue like David. And it got so bad that according to Vasari, sometimes he would go to try to peel off his boots. And because he hadn't showered for so long, the boots were clinging to his to the skin of his foot and calf. Sometimes he would peel off skin when he pulled off his boot. So this gives you a sense of what Michelangelo was like. Leonardo was the was the rival of Michelangelo. And of course, the two like to make fun of each other. So here's what Leonardo commented. And this is a private uh, thought that he wrote to himself in his notebook. Uh, but he's making fun of Michelangelo. He says, you know, when you look at Michelangelo, you know, he sculpts these beefcakes with these like ripped muscles and like uh, exaggerated muscles on those, especially when we see uh, some of his later work. Leonardo criticizes it for looking like, he said his people look like a, a sack of walnuts or a bundle of radishes with their bulging muscles. So we've got two geniuses living in the same city at the same time. The Signoria of Florence said, we really have to capitalize on this. So they sort of played a trick on Leonardo and Michelangelo, and they hired both of them to work at a, in a government building at the same time. And they didn't know that they were going to be working together until they were actually in there. And both of them were supposed to paint or fresco uh, a wall on either side of a hallway uh, representing battle scenes in Florentine history. Um, so you have uh, this, which was, and, and check out the guys there. Look at look at how strong and ripped their muscles are. Um, this was a you know particular battle scene from Florence's history. Uh, this was done by Michelangelo, of course. So he likes his beef cake men. Um, and then on the other wall, uh, there was uh, the Battle of Angieri, if I remember correctly. And this is uh, Leonardo da Vinci. And it's very, very da Vinci-like. You've got a lot of movement. You've got a lot of violence. There's kind of a whoosh to it. Uh, so that's, uh, that's, that's Leonardo's. So both these guys were you know, frescoing or painting a wall at this, <laughs> on either side of the hallway at the same time. I can only imagine what they were saying to each other. Now, when we think of Michelangelo, it's very important to know the Pope that patronized him. And this was the very famous and very important Pope, Pope Julius II. Now, Pope Julius II was Pope from 14, I'm sorry, from 1503. Um, he became Pope when Alexander VI died, and then he took over. Um, Alexander VI and Julius II did not like each other. They, they were rivals themselves. And Julius II, at, when, he, when he becomes the Pope, um, he has to defend the Papal States. Remember that Cesare Borgia had, had, had fought to you know, expand the Papal States. Now, when Julius II takes it over, and he's not going to have Cesare Borgia work for him anymore, um, he has to maintain uh, his state. And uh, he does this not by having a son fight for him. He actually leads troops in a battle. So here's something to think about. A pope leading a Papal army into battle. Needless to say, he gets the moniker the Warrior Pope. And some people think this makes uh, Pope Julius II really cool. And other people think it makes him very unchristian, leading a papal army into battle. But it is Pope Julius II who was the most important uh, patron of, uh, of, of Michelangelo after the Medici. And he summons Michelangelo several times to Rome. When he summons Michelangelo to Rome... He has him stop in this coastal city in Italy called Carrara. Carrara is where they hew marble out of this particular mountain for Italian marble. They did it back then, and they still do it today. So if you get Italian marble, chances are it's coming from Carrara. And Michelangelo is there, and he spent several months there just uh, you know, essentially harvesting marble, hewing the marble out. out and um, having it shipped to Rome in preparation for his next big project. And his next big project was supposed to be uh, sculptures for Pope Julius II's tomb. So Pope Julius II wanted a nice tomb, and he hired Michelangelo to do the sculptures for the tomb. But then Pope Julius II changes his mind, and he immediately summons Michelangelo to Rome without the marble and says, I have a new project for you, and the project is this. Adjacent to St. Peter's Basilica, which is in the process of being constructed at this time, there is something called the Sistine Chapel, named after a previous monk whose name was, was or not a previous pope, who was uh, Pope uh, Sixtus. And, um, and, this, and this chapel uh, is 
Michelangelo is asked to, to, to paint the ceiling. But it's not really painting the ceiling because if you just painted a ceiling, um, for those of us who have painted a ceiling, as we know, you know, you're gonna have to paint it again in 10 years. That paint is not going to last. If you wanna put a painting on the ceiling and make it last, you have to do something called fresco. So here's an example of fresco. I found these pictures uh, that are obviously recent from online. So I guess there are still artists out there who do fresco. So take a look at the left side here. When you fresco, the first thing you do is you slap down this mortar. You do that, and then that is the fresh mortar. Fresco is the Italian word for fresh. And so you've got this fresh mortar that's down there. Now, so that is actually, you know, part of the wall. And then, now shift your focus over to the right-hand side, then you paint it. And so by painting it, um, the, the mortar then absorbs the paint, and essentially the paint becomes part of the wall. Now, in order to do this, you've got to do it fast because that fresco will dry. And once it dries, you're done. You can't, you can't paint it. It's, it, it's, it's not going to work. Or it's not going to hold. So what Michelangelo had to do when he was going to fresco the ceiling is he had to slap that mortar on. He had to do a cartoon outline of what he wanted to paint. And then, boom, he had to paint it. He had to do it quick before it all dried. What an amazing thing. The Sistine Chapel ceiling, there is no good photograph, no good image I can show you of the Sistine Chapel ceiling. You just simply have to go see it. You cannot capture the enormity of this ceiling and the power that it has over the people who look at it. Uh, you, other than you just have to be there. That's it. But this ceiling is two stories high. So... Please think of what Michelangelo had to, had to do. He had to build scaffolding up to the top there. He had to fresco. He had to cartoon. Then he had to paint. And he had to do this all while standing looking up. Now, I have never frescoed a ceiling, but I have painted a living room ceiling before. And let me tell you, after doing that for one day, my neck hurt. I could have really used a massage after doing that for one day. He did this for four years. And think of how difficult it was to get the proportion right. He's, he, he's got to make it look good, not from where he's looking at it, from two feet away, his arm's length, but rather two stories away for the congregation that's down in the, in the, in, on the floor of the Sistine Chapel looking up. So it took him four years to do this. Pope Julius II would be throwing apprentices at him. Michelangelo can't stand any apprentices, so he's firing them right and left. Julius is getting angry because this work isn't getting done in time. A lot of you, if you know if your parents have had major work done in their house, they tend to get angry because the workmen say, hey, this will only take two months, and it ends up taking half a year. And Julius II was getting after Michelangelo for taking too long. Michelangelo, meanwhile, is a perfectionist, and he's like, you're not painting this. You don't know how difficult it is. Go away, Julius. And so the two of them had a very, very, very contentious relationship. They did not like each other. Michelangelo, uh, when he was relaxing a few times, he, did, he, he wrote all this angry poetry about having to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And he did this little drawing of himself uh, showing his neck bent back and he's uh, you know, painting up and the paint stripping down into his eyes. So obviously the Sistine Chapel is too big to talk about the whole thing, but you know, there is the iconic middle piece. The Sistine Chapel show ceiling shows scenes from the book of Genesis, such as the creation of Adam. Here's God with uh, endowing Adam with the spark of life uh, and, and, and Adam coming alive. Uh, so the creation of Adam. Uh, here's, I find this one fascinating. This is of course, Adam and Eve being tempted by the serpent, the devil coming as a serpent and offering them a fruit uh, typically today we think of this as an apple, but it was a fruit from the tree of life in the Garden of Eden that God told him not to eat from. It's a, just a very, very interesting image because look at Eve. That Eve is one brawny, masculine woman. So uh, it, for me, this is a very interesting image and, and, and really kind of captures Michelangelo and how he started painting or frescoing people or sculpting people uh, as he got a little bit older. I think I've mentioned that uh, uh, Michelangelo did not like the Pope very much. The Pope uh, was always frustrated with Michelangelo. And so Michelangelo did a so, little something special for the Pope. 
Uh, he frescoed this and a part of the Sistine Chapel where he knew the Pope couldn't see. Uh, the roof of the Sistine Chapel was, of course, curved, and it curved down and where it matched the wall, there were particular places that you couldn't see if you were standing on the floor looking up. And so Michelangelo uh, frescoed these two, looks like young boys, and one of them is holding a fig in his hand. And holding a fig in your hand would have been the equivalent of doing something like flipping somebody off today. It was a rude gesture. And uh, Michelangelo no doubt did this as a rude gesture to the Pope, knowing that the Pope would never be able to see it. Uh, it's tucked away in the corner. And when you visit the Sistine Chapel, you can't see it. But the Sistine Chapel is one of the most amazing works of the Renaissance by the gift of Michelangelo. And I forgot to mention, Michelangelo never really painted before this. He doesn't like to paint. He hates to paint. He had no desire to paint and, and, and was really angry that the Pope, you know, even forced him to do this. But he, he had no choice. Michelangelo was getting patronized. He was getting paid. Pope tells him what to do. He's got to do it. One of the things that uh, Michelangelo does for the Pope is help in the construction of St. Peter's Basilica. So St. Peter's is the original church of Rome uh, for, from, for a long time, for, over, for uh, probably about 1,500 years. St. Peter's was actually an old pagan temple in Rome. And then during the 15th century, they decided to build a proper church, a, a huge cathedral. And, for, and they wanted to make it the, the biggest cathedral in the world, since Rome is the center of the Roman Catholic Church. And so this was under construction at the time. And the construction and the expense of the construction of St. Peter's Basilica is one of the things that helped spark the Reformation. It's, a, it's an absolutely huge structure. And if you go inside of it, which, which you can today, um, to visit it, you do not have to be Catholic. You can go in. There is a particular uh, a dress code that you have to abide by when you go into St. Peter's Basilica, but that's it. Anybody can visit it. Um, it, it. It gives you a sense of incredible grandeur, and it makes you feel very small. And that's the that's the point of this architecture. It's to make you feel very small in the presence of God. It it's it's an absolutely huge, incredible, dizzying piece of architecture. And what Michelangelo contributed to it was this. This is the dome. So Brunelleschi designed the dome and helped, uh, uh, and, and helped design the construction of, and, and plan out the construction for the dome in Florence. Michelangelo designed this dome in, for the St. Peter's Basilica. And I don't know if you can see, there actually are people up on the uh, round top there. You, you can climb up there and, and you can uh, look out over Rome from the top of St. Peter's Basilica. Michelangelo did this for free. Uh, this was his gift to the church. He received no payment for it. And here's something else fun that Michelangelo uh, designed that you can still see in uh, Rome today. The Swiss Guard. The Swiss Guard are young men from Switzerland who are the guards for the Pope. And uh, there's Pope Francis, the Pope at the time of the recording of this slideshow. And that is uh, still the outfit that Michelangelo designed. Very colorful, very flashy. When you're in Rome, you can't miss the Swiss Guard, and you can look at their uniforms and know that Michelangelo made them and so that's uh, or designed them. So it makes them pretty special. Near the end of the life uh, of his life, uh, Michelangelo received a commission to go back into the Sistine Chapel to do something else in the Sistine Chapel. You see, at the end of the Sistine Chapel, behind the altar, there there is this two-story high fresco. At the end of his life, Michelangelo was literally in his 80s when he was asked to fresco this. So Michelangelo in his 80s, he's going to have to build the scaffolding, go up there and do all this in his 80s. Most of us should be very well retired in our 80s, but Michelangelo did this. I mean, that in and of itself reveals uh, his passion and his talent. You know, this man did not quit. And this particular fresco is called The Last Judgment. So let's check this out if you can see this. Just look at the whole thing here. In the middle, you see a man holding up his right hand with a woman at his side. That is Jesus and the Mother Mary. The painting is called The Last Judgment, which gives us a hint as to what this is about. This is Jesus commanding certain people to go to hell. <laughs> Their bodies are dropping down and they're in a state of horror and shock. These are the bad people going to hell. 
whereas others who are the good Christians are going up into heaven. Uh, there's been a lot of psychoanalysis on this particular uh, fresco because Michelangelo was himself at the end of his life and very devoutly religious himself and probably was thinking about his own eternal soul while he was painting that this. And uh, I'll show you a detail of, of that here in a second. Here is uh, Jesus in the middle of the Last Judgment. Now take a look at this Jesus. He's probably very different from any other image of Jesus you've ever seen in your life. This is beefcake Jesus. This is superhero Jesus. This isn't uh, the nice sacrificial lamb Jesus of the first time around. This is the Jesus come back to kick butt. There are certain people that are going to heaven. There are a lot more that are going to hell. Now, an important thing to know about this particular painting is Michelangelo, the humanist uh, a painter or, or artist that he was, he really drew a lot of inspiration from ancient Greece and ancient Rome. And he had frescoed Jesus naked. But that was too much for some of the religious authority. They looked at a naked Jesus with Jesus's genitalia behind the altar of this chapel. And they thought, this is too much. This is too much. So the cloth that you see spread out around Jesus's thighs and covering up his genitalia was not frescoed on there by Michelangelo. Instead, it was frescoed on there by other artists hired by the church after Michelangelo was done. This devastated Michelangelo. Uh, essentially, he felt that the church was calling him a pervert to a certain degree, and he was really uh, disgusted by this when he thought that the human form was a wonderful thing to celebrate and that there was absolutely nothing wrong with this. So very much a, a, an example of, of, of humanism in, uh, in, in Michelangelo's artwork. Uh, you've got people who are going to hell in uh, The Last Judgment and you have the uh, terror and the emotion as uh, certain satanic uh, creatures are pulling the person down. This is one of the most interesting parts of The Last Judgment that a lot of people like to point to. This is St. Bartholomew. And if you look at it, St. Bartholomew is getting ready to go to heaven. Uh, notice that he has been covered up with a little bit of a, a loincloth there too by other uh, uh, artists. St. Bartholomew has ripped off his skin. And St. Bartholomew is getting ready to let his skin drop down into hell while his soul, which you see embodied in this nice figure here, is getting ready to ascend up into heaven. And if we look at that skin, for a lot of people, it looks like Michelangelo. So Michelangelo is painting, and this is just one interpretation, he's painting his own skin, getting ready to be dropped down into hell, while hopefully his soul rises up into heaven. And this uh, was one of the last major things that Michelangelo did before the end of his life. So Michelangelo, genius. Uh, had contentious relationships with the Pope, was very competitive with Leonardo da Vinci, uh, but certainly a genius. Uh, he didn't want to paint and yet painted one of the most amazing things of the Renaissance. And as a sculptor, what he painted or what he sculpted it would, it would be hard to surpass. So this is the story of Michelangelo. Thanks, Euro Bears, for paying attention. Hope you learned something. Hope you enjoy it. Have a great day.